So I'm sure by now you're quite familiar with the title of our retreats, Letting Good, Letting Evil, and Letting God. No? And uh, today, obviously, on Holy Saturday and for, for Easter Sunday, we are focusing on the third letting, uh, the third granting of permission. You will notice that each one of them involves a granting of permission uh, from us. We grant permission to the good. We grant permission to the evil, the way God does as well. And now we, we are focusing on granting permission to God for Holy Saturday and Easter Sunday. It's always a temptation to rush to Easter Sunday. No? Um, but I think it's important for us to just recall uh, before we rush into Easter Sunday, what happened yesterday. And for our retreat, we focus on these statements. No? We express our gratitude to the Lord Jesus for, for fighting for us and for never giving up on us. It's a slight departure from the usual portrayal, portrayal of our Lord as victim, no? but it is very much in the spirit of scripture. No? Our Lord was a warrior. He was fighting evil no? and he was fighting for us, for being relentless, even if battered and bruised, no? and doing all this because he loved us till his very last breath. So Holy Saturday is a time to, to be with the dead Jesus, before we rush to Easter Sunday, before we rush to the empty tomb, the, the tomb still has the corpse of our Lord, the, 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 the body of our Lord no? uh, that was hurriedly buried. So at this point, I'd like to invite you to just spend a minute recalling the presence of our Lord in our lives, but in a special way, thinking of what it might mean to us or what it might feel like for us to have our Lord dead for us, at least for this interval between Good Friday and Easter Sunday. And if you are so moved, in case you have lost a loved one recently, you may want to type out the name of that person on the chat box um, so that we can all pray for them. Let's take a moment of silence. There are so many names that we've listed down of people we've lost and I'm sure all of us miss them and we want to be able to hear their voice again and touch them. So let's close our opening prayer by thinking of our Lord because our Lord connects us to them even if they've gone ahead of us. If we can touch the Lord, we can touch the loved ones that we have lost to death. We entrust to you all the people that we have lost, all our loved ones. And we know that through you, we are continually in touch with them. And we ask you to give them peace. We offer all our efforts during this, ret this retreat for the repose of their soul. Amen. Eternal rest grant unto them, O Lord, and let perpetual light shine upon them. May they rest in peace. Amen. May their souls and the souls of all the faithful departed through the tender mercy of God rest in peace. Amen. In the name of the Father, of the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, so um, I'd like to thank uh, our I'd like to thank our Seneca sisters for their beautiful performance of that song, uh, written by Father Manolin Francisco. I think it captures many of our sentiments. No as we begin our day three retreat. So our third day, Holy Saturday and Easter Sunday is focused on letting God know. So whatever does that mean, I hope we will find out today, which is our last day. Before that, I just want to say that in case you want to join our uh, online community on Facebook and Viber, this is not, some people thought this was for donations, it's not, no, it's just to join, uh, to follow us on Facebook. Uh, on the left side, you see the English, Pins of Light. No? So we have a Facebook page. And then you see the QR code for the Viber group in case you want to join the Viber group. On the right side, we have the Filipino uh, community. Basically what we do is we, we send a one minute homily every Sunday. No one else is allowed to broadcast anything. So you will not be getting a lot of notifications from everyone. No? You will only get one notification from, from the, the source of Pins of Light. So in case you want to join us, this will also be found on the Facebook page. No? We'll show that again later. So I just wanted to explain that. 
Okay, I also want to thank Mary Sheras, one of our uh, attendees who came up with this artwork uh, to summarize one of the big ideas that apparently touched her. Uh, the moment we forget to think, evil happens. So clearly a reference to Hannah Arendt's insight into the banality of evil. No? And a reminder to us that it's our job, especially those of us who've received the privilege of a good education, to exercise thinking and to help other people think, no matter how difficult that is. No? Because the moment we stop thinking, great evil can happen. Okay, so thank you, Mary. Okay, so um, we'll do something different today. We will begin with a Q&A because we did not have a chance to do that yesterday. But instead of opening the floor, what we've done is that we've actually gone through your questions and we've sort of put together some of the questions that we think should be addressed no, this morning. And uh, I'm going to call this portion, what do you mean? Because a lot of the questions were, Father, what do you mean when you said this? No, So, so I basically picked seven burning questions. No? And, uh, and I think these are important questions so that I, have, I can clarify if I wasn't able to talk about them adequately yesterday. A lot of comments, a lot of questions are centered around these seven topics. No? Let me just warn you that um, these are very complicated questions and I have, no, um, I have no illusion that I'll be able to resolve them completely. No? But I think what's important about this retreat is that we're raising questions and we're thinking about our faith. I think that's what's important even if we don't get the final answers. No? In fact, to many of these questions, the definite answer we will get only after we die and we interview God. No? But it's important for us to make sense of our faith. No? So I'd like to, to just go through the seven burning questions and try my best to clarify them because I, I, I probably wasn't very clear yesterday. No? So the very first one, what do you mean that I should also practice critical thinking and religion? That's a very good question. No? Should I question the dogma of the Holy Trinity, for example? You know, these are very valid questions, especially for us Catholics, because we accept the church teachings. No? We accept doctrines. So how would we answer this? No? So the way I would answer this is with another question. Are the, are the church teachings, our doctrines and dogmas, are they religious facts or are they religious judgments? Remember when we said fact, it's more fundamentalist. Judgment is more critical thinking. I would like to propose to you that all our church teachings, doctrines, and dogmas, including the Bible itself, all the books in the Bible, are the product of the churches over 2,000 years of prayer and critical thinking as guided by the Holy Spirit. In short, which books to include in the Bible, how to formulate the church teachings, which doctrines to accept, which dogmas to formulate, all of these are result of the religious judgment of the church as guided by the Holy Spirit. So by all means, critical thinking is not a sin. No? Uh, it's important for us because what do you do with facts? Facts you just receive passively at, without question. But judgments are the product of an evaluation uh, done by other people. No? And you're supposed to evaluate it yourself so that it will become more meaningful to you. So going back to the dogma of the Holy Trinity, that there are three persons in one God, if you only memorized it and accepted it as a fact, it won't be meaningful to you. But if you began to question it and say, what does that mean? Why did the church come up with three persons in one God? What is the value of that? I think that dogma will be more meaningful to you. So the answer is yes. The more you do critical thinking, critical thinking doesn't mean you're going to criticize. It means you're going to think about it and ask questions so that you will understand better, okay? Uh, you know, as we know, faith is not just feelings. It's not just actions, it's not just understanding. No? To have a total faith, you have to have all three. No? And by feelings, I mean you have to trust God and you have to be able to have a relationship with him in prayer. No? That's a very important part of faith. No? Also, you have to live it out in your life, through your moral life. No? If, you're, if you're all feelings about God, you're always in a spiritual high, you always say praise Jesus, but if I look at your moral life, you're committing all the crimes and sins, there's something not quite right there, right? So action, it should also be translated into action. But faith should also be aligned to our understanding. No? Uh, we have to exercise our critical thinking. No? Because if we believe our faith intellectually, then that means that our faith is more total. No? Now, we don't have to have all three. No? It's not necessary to have feelings of faith, actions of faith, understanding of faith. We only need one of them. Can you guess which one? We only need action. Because remember, at the last judgment, our Lord asks us 
what have you done to the least of my brothers and sisters? That's all that matters. Even if you don't feel that God is close to you, as long as you're doing the right thing, even if you don't understand your faith, actions are most important. But the point I'm trying to make here is the more total our faith is, the more it includes feelings, actions, and understanding, the fuller our faith is. So especially for those of us who can afford to engage in critical thinking, I think it's a challenge we must accept. It's an obligation. You know? So there's nothing wrong. It's not a sin to do critical thinking as long as your motive is not to look for holes and to reject the teaching, but to understand it more and to grow in your faith. You know? And finally, the thing I want to say here is that we have to have faith in our faith. You know? Don't be afraid of questions. God can handle your questions. You know? Don't be afraid of asking questions about your faith. Don't, don't be worried about expressing doubts about your faith because there's probably going to be an answer. You know? Because you have to have, we have to have faith in our faith. You know? Our faith has been there for 2,000 years, and we have a very strong intellectual tradition in the Catholic Church. So reason has played a lot, a very important role in our tradition. No? So I, I doubt if any question is going to make me lose my faith. No? In fact, it's going to strengthen my faith, I think. No? Okay, question number two, another what do you mean question. What do you mean Adam and Eve ate of the forbidden fruit? Did they exist historically? No? A very good question because yesterday I began with the story of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden just as I did the day before on the story of creation. So did, did, do I believe it literally as in God created the universe and all that there is only in seven days, only six days and rested in the seven? In short, I don't believe in evolution. No? Did I believe that there was really an Adam and Eve who actually romped around naked in the garden and was tempted by a serpent? Did they exist historically? No? I think it's important for us to talk about truth. No? Um, a fundamentalist reading will take the Bible literally no? and say everything the Bible said is historical. So six days lang yan, no? the creation. And yes, there was an Adam, there was an Eve, and they ran around in the garden naked until they ate of the forbidden fruit because of the serpent. No? So if you're, a fundament if you're doing a fundamentalist reading, you're going to be focused and even obsessed with the actual chronolog chronology of events. We're not there. That's not the purpose, no? That's not the purpose. The purpose is really to do a critical reading. No? And a critical reading has a wider notion of truth, um, a richer concept of truth, which is greater than just historical truth. No? Truth is more than just chrono chronology of events. The meaning of the text is important. No? So on the first day, we talked about original goodness. That's the meaning of the text. That is true that we were focusing on. What about Adam and Eve? What is the meaning? No? Just like the story of creation, the seven-day creation, we are not taking the story literally. More than the actual chronology of events, what matters is the meaning of the story. And yesterday, I tried to express the two points that are important. No? The first is that evil did not enter the world only through human freedom, but through a power beyond us. And this was symbolized by the serpent. No? I think this is a very important truth because, and I talked about spiritual powers, right, yesterday, because some people might say, oh, you know, evil is just human freedom. No, the story of Genesis tells us there was something else. No? Many of us believe it's the devil, no? but it, there's a power beyond us, an evil spirit that actually can influence us. And as we said on the first day through our thoughts, and that was symbolized by the serpent. This is the meaning that we were focusing on, not so much that there was an Adam and Eve who, you know, who were, who, who disobeyed God, no? But certainly there was a first sin, no? uh, original sin, and that's what original sin is about. The second thing I was, uh, the second meaning of the story that I wanted to focus on. By original sin, I'm not talking about, you know, they ate the apple or whatever fruit it was. Some people say it was banana or, or pineapple. We don't know. The Bible wasn't explicit. And we don't really care because we're not doing a fundamentalist reading. No? The, the point of the Bible is we have what we call original sin today, you know? which is a very real human condition in which sinfulness already exists because of previous generations. And this is what's important. It tends to be replicated. Without God's grace, without our effort, we will end up doing what previous generations have been doing. If you remember the, the path in the woods, remember I said that everyone's using one path, no? but because of Jesus, he started using another path. Unless we consciously do that, and ask for Jesus' help, 
we will just replicate the sinfulness of previous generations. Okay, so two important uh, truths that we wanted to focus on from the story of Adam and Eve. Not so much about exactly what happened because we don't know exactly how it happened. No? But at first, there are spiritual forces that lead us to sin, symbolized by the serpent. Secondly, more than our human behavior, there's a human condition, an environment that sort of gives us a predisposition to sin. Okay? Those are the two important things. No? So don't get lost in the details of text and delay. Uh, did Eve come from the rib of Adam and so on and so forth? No, Let's not get lost in that. That would be more a fundamentalist concern. Okay? Okay, so at this point, I hope things are a little bit, you know, in the process of getting clearer. If they're not, that's also okay, because that means you will continue to think about it and hopefully talk about this so that your faith will somehow get stronger as you think about it and talk about it. The problem with faith is that it's not that we don't believe. The problem with our faith is that we don't think about it. We don't pay attention to it. We don't spend too much time on it. So if the talks today will provoke you to do that, I think that's going to be good. That's going to be a healthy thing for your faith. Okay? Okay, third question. Third, what do you mean? What do you mean God does not have full control over the open system? Isn't he all-powerful? Okay, we got a lot of this, no? and some of them in caps, no? because some people were getting nervous. No? Uh, what does it mean when we say open system and God does not have full control? Are you saying God is not all-powerful? He's not in control? Uh, we began to answer this already because there was a question in the chat box, but I'd like to spend a bit more time explaining this. Because I don't want you to misunderstand this. No? Um, okay. So if... I think you're right. If you don't have full control because you did not have a choice, then yes, you're not all powerful. All of us, we don't have full control over our lives. No? We don't have full control over the world. That's very obvious in this pandemic. If we had full control, well, any virus they had. That virus would have been eliminated from day one. The moment they said, we're all going to work from home, we can't go out. I'm sure all of us would have agreed immediately, let's, let's kill the virus. But we don't have full control. No? Therefore, obviously, we're not all powerful, but we did not have a choice. It wasn't as if we said, okay, we can have full control, but we choose not to. No? That's the case with God. No? God does not exercise complete control in the world and in our own lives, not because he can't, but because he chose to create an open system. No? This means that God is still all powerful. He has just decided to restrain his power because there was something in the open system that he saw that was valuable. And some of you were already able to say you know, what it was in the chat box in the discussion. But I just wanna say here, here's the difference between a boss, the picture on top, just giving the orders and the followers you know, just following him because they're afraid of him and he has power, right? And then we have a true leader. A true leader is really leading, right? Working along with the followers. No? And this shows us, sorry, this shows us the difference between power or influence, between push or pull. So if I can ask you, between a leader who exercises influence and people follow him because they believe in him, and a boss who exercises power and the, the followers follow him only because they're scared of him, only because they're pushed to do so and they're not pulled, just, just like what the leader is doing, which one do you think is really more powerful? Is it the boss or the leader? I hope you agree with me when I say it's the leader. Because the boss you will follow only as long as he's around. You know? Behind his back, when you're in the toilet chatting with your office mates, you're going to backbite your boss because you can't stand his guts, right? Or her guts. You know? So influence shows real power. Pull shows real, influence, real power as well, no? And in the same way, when you think about it, God could have chosen to be a boss and just control everything and scare us to death. But that's not how he planned to do it. He preferred to invite us, to pull us, to invite us through influence. And I think that's the greater power. Think about it. Um, now, what about the open system? We've said that the open system has two unintended consequences. No? Unintended because God is all good and he doesn't want he didn't, he didn't create the open system to make us suffer sickness and death, accidents and natural disasters. He did not design the open system so that people can commit sins. No, 
These are unintended byproducts of the open system. So what's the intended consequence of the open system? Um, some of you have already guessed it in the chat box a couple of days ago or even yesterday. You know? It's the possibility of love. It's not possible to love unless we have freedom, unless we live in a universe of freedom. You know? So, and whenever you have freedom, because of freedom, there's a possibility of moral evil, right? So if you're giving human beings freedom, they can choose to love you and do what's good, but they can also choose to do wrong. Now, what about physical evil? Anong kinalaman niyan sa freedom, no? Uh, God also decided to give freedom to nature, that the nature will be governed by its own laws, that he would not be in full control of the way nature is played out. Remember the chess game, no? There are laws of nature, and God designed those laws, no? But the way those laws are actually operational cannot be predicted. It's not controlled by God, no? He chose not to control it. Now, why would God design a universe where there are natural laws? Many theologians say, you will not learn how to use your freedom responsibly, and you will not learn how to love if you live in a magical world where there are no consequences. So for example, if you live in a Disney, Disney world, a cartoon world, no? where if you jump out the building or push somebody out the building, uh, that person will, will splatter all over the, the, the ground, but in one second will, will fall right back into one, one person. No? We will never learn to use our freedom responsibly, and we will never really learn to love authentically no? if the universe were magical, if the universe were not governed by the laws of nature. So this is the best judgment no? that theologians have come up with to make sense of evil and sin. It is not the last word. But so far in my own readings and conversations with other people, I found this, I found this to be the very best explanation. Maybe there's, there'll be a better one. No? And if you find a better one, by all means, go to that better one. But what's important about this explanation is that it acknowledges that we have freedom, that the world has natural laws, and that God does not fully control everything because he chose not to. Those are very important realities. No? And I think all you need to do is live a few years in this earth to realize that they're true. No? So for me, this is the best explanation of the open system. Okay, okay. number four, this is another one. No? What do you mean God's will is not necessarily followed? No? When I talked about the Garden of Eden, I said it showed us that God's will, which is don't eat the forbidden fruit, was not necessarily followed. So I got, I got a lot of questions. Do you think everything that happens here is God's will? Do you think the pandemic is God's will? If somebody kills another person, an innocent person, do you think that's God's will? Because if you say that, what are you saying about God? What kind of a God do you believe in? No? So I think we have to pause here and ask ourselves whether it is true, in fact, that God's will is not necessarily followed in this world, no? in this world that we know. No? Um, we talked about the open system, how there are interacting causes. And because of these interacting causes, they co-determine events. No? Now, the open system is from the philosophy of the sciences. It's not from the Bible. But it's important for us to use whatever we can to make sense of our faith, right? And I found this very helpful, the concept of the open system. Because if you apply the open system to what we're talking about, no? if the system were closed, no? there will only be God's will determining all the events. The laws of nature will not determine events. Human freedom will not determine events. No? In short, there will only be a divine cause. But as we know, that's not true. No? There are also natural causes. There are also human causes. No? I don't know if you've read of people who wanted to prove that God existed, that they were chosen by God. So they said, I, I, I'm going to believe that I can fly. No? So I'm going to jump off the roof. Um, more often than not, as far as I know, the laws of nature were not violated. They fell to their death. No? So uh, what the events are co-determined are determined not only by God's will or divine cause, but also by natural causes and human causes. And I think 
uh, any thinking person will see this, no? Um, and also, because of that, we should not blame God for everything that happens, no? For example, I grew a pimple on my nose this morning. It's God's will that I grew a pimple, no? Or for example, uh, somebody was very careless about uh, infecting other people and, and, and organized a party, no? Where they had a, they, they a sit-down dinner, which is the worst type because all the droplets are all, all over the place. And everyone gets infected. And then you say, oh, but God's will. God wanted all of us to be infected. You know? I think that's really blaming God for something that he's not responsible for. You know? uh, because the laws of nature are going to be followed. You know? The virus is going to work the way it does. And if people don't follow the protocol, you are going to be infected. You must blame the laws of nature, especially yourself, if you get infected because you've been deliberately careless. You know? Don't just say it's God's will. No? But we've also added, aside from these three, we also have good and evil spirits, and we also have structure and culture. For example, I would say that uh, original sin would be part of the structure and culture that we live in that affect human freedom. No? Good and evil spirits also affect us, and we said they affect us through our thoughts. No? So this would be spiritual causes and social causes. So. This is a very simplified diagram, even if it looks complicated, no? but basically it shows us that there are so many kinds of causes at work in the universe. No? And we should not be in denial and say it's only all God's will. No? Uh, I mean, I wanna say, give me a break, no? because um, like for example, poverty, no matter how, poverty is a social cause, no? it's a structure. No matter how intelligent I am, if I'm born to a poor family, for example, no matter how determined I am to study, if I'm not nourished properly, if I'm malnourished, and I don't get the opportunities that other privileged people get, I'm not going to go up the social ladder. No? So all these things affect one another. No? And this interplay co-determine events. No? So God is very much present, but he, has, he respects the other causes as well. Okay? So not everything that happens in the world is because of God, unfortunately. So this is another way of looking at it. There are natural causes, there are social causes, there are spiritual causes that can lead to good things, to neutral things and evil things. What does God allow? Uh, an evil, there can be natural evil, suffering, death, human evil, sin, social evil like poverty, uh, spiritual evil, no? um, if you corrupt other people. No? What does God allow? God allows all of that to happen. No? He allows even the unintended consequences. But what is God's will? God's will is only what is good. Only the, fir the first column. Because, that, because God is all good and he cannot want something evil. He cannot want something evil. Okay. Now, I'm actually giving you a summary of a, maybe a four-year course in theology, you know? But I've distilled them into uh, simple diagrams that you, I hope you can begin to think about, you can continue to think about, and continue to talk about. No? And ask yourself, what does it mean if I agree with this? No? What does it mean what, if I agree with this? Okay. Now, if you, don't, if you don't think it's helping you, you can just ignore it. You don't have to remember everything I say. No? So not everything that happens in the world is God's will because he allows many things to happen, including evil, unfortunately, but that is not his will. The evil things happen because of the other causes, because of the other causes, okay? So let's go back to our metaphors for God, no? And I want to take a little survey here so we can take a little break because I know that that's a rather heavy theological discussion, no? So we have three metaphors here. We have the watchmaker, no? Who, who after creating the watch, after producing the watch, is no longer involved in the operation of the watch, no? Because the watch automatically works already. Just like the universe, has the laws of nature to make it operate. On the other extreme, you have the scientist who, in the laboratory who has full control of what happens. No? He's a little bit obsessive compulsive. He wants to make sure that no extraneous variable gets in the way of the experiment. So only the effect that he wants will happen. No? So if you go back to the previous diagram, there will only be the divine cause. Everything else has been muted, has been controlled. No? There's no more human cause, no social cause no um, spiritual cause, no? it's all divine cause. So everything that happens in the laboratory in a scientist's God is God's will, no? but that's a closed system. But what we're saying is that actually 
uh, it seems that the proper metaphor, given uh, the teachings of the church, given scripture, and given our own experience, is that God is more like a gardener. You know, a gardener, which means that he does not completely control all the elements in the garden, but he's always taking care of us. He's always taking care of us. So these are the three metaphors. And of course, the image of God that I'd like to propose to you is the gardener. But before that, I want to add another image of God because I want to be, it's, a very, uh, it's a very prevalent image of God as well. And it's the image of God as a vending machine. I know you might think that's a little weird, no? but uh, I think many of us think of God as a vending machine. And I want us to just pause here and question our image, our default image of God. No? So there you have the scientist who has total control and then you have the watchmaker who has no involvement in our lives and in our world anymore. And then you have the gardener who's always caring for us, even if he does not have complete, he does not, he chooses not to have full control. What about the vending machine? What happens in a vending machine? In a vending machine, you put in the right amount of coins and then you get what you want. I think many of us have that image of God no? where we are actually controlling God. It's the exact opposite of the scientist. So I want us to think about our spiritual life. Of course, the correct answer is gardener, right? unless you disagree, which is fine. No? But as far as I can see, as far as my own experience is concerned, I would say that the gardener best captures the image of God that our Lord teaches us about. No? But looking at the other three, which one is your default image of God? What tends to be your automatic image of God? Without thinking, without you know, saying, ang tamang sagot, the correct answer is gardener, according to Father. No, no. Let's get that out of the way. So you have three choices. No? You have the vending machine, where we completely control God through our prayers. I'm going to do a little sacrifice. I'm not going to drink wine today. Hopefully, God will make me you know, get accepted to this university. No? Or I'm going to make the sacrifice. I'm going to say 10 decades of the rosary so that God will grant me my petition. Parang vending machine, right? The other extreme is the scientist where God can be blamed for everything that happens in the world. And then you have the watchmaker where God has nothing to do with what's going on in the world. Maybe you believe in him as a creator, no? but he's not, in, he's not really involved in my life anymore, okay? So I'll give you um, a few minutes to fill out the poll. And the, our friends in Facebook Live, there will also be a poll there, I think. No? So please think about not the right answer, but what's your default image of God? I think this is going to be very interesting. So I'll give you a minute first. Uh, our friends in Facebook, can you just type out on the comment uh, whether it's A, B, or C? A is vending machine, uh, B is watchmaker, and C is scientist. We just want to get a quick survey. You know? Again, we're not aiming for a scientific or reliable, uh, very precise survey. It's just good to know what the profile is. And we're going to compare the Zoom people with the Facebook Live people and see what it looks like. Let's see if there's a pattern. Okay, um, I'll give you another minute to just fill out the poll. I think it's very interesting. Okay, I think uh, we have a pattern. No? It's a clear pattern. So I'm going to stop the poll now and I'm going to share the poll with you. No? Um, okay, so there you have it. No? So uh, in the Zoom poll, vending machine got two thirds. No? Vending machine got two thirds followed. There's almost a tie between watchmaker and scientists with scientists slightly higher. I'm told by my team that on Facebook, uh, a survey of the comments uh, yield the same result. It's vending machine. No? Now that's very interesting. Okay, 
And I think there's a lot to think about, no? Uh, what does that mean, no? What does that mean that many of us tend to think of God as a vending machine? Um, you may want to think about that, no? Why do you think of God as a vending machine? But you, you can almost buy him. If you give him the, if you give the right, uh, if you do the right action or do the right thing, he's going to reward you, no? And how has that worked out for you? Because uh, I don't know, but given the experience of myself and many of my friends, it doesn't usually happen that way. Sometimes the good people, the nice guys finish last, as we can see around us. No? And the wicked guys sleep very well and actually prosper. No? So it seems that the vending machine is not the right metaphor for God. No? Uh, actually, to be honest with you, I thought scientists would be the number one answer. No? Because most pious believers would really just say everything is under the control of God. No? But somehow it's good to see that um, uh, a lot of you also are watchmaker. No? So it's almost a tie between watchmaker and scientist. Most unbelievers would say watchmaker no? because they don't believe that God is concerned. No? Uh, or sometimes there are times in my life when God is a watchmaker because I don't want him to make pakailam. I don't want him to get involved. I want to live my life the way I want to. So I think of him, it's a convenient metaphor for me to think of him as a watchmaker God. But if God is a vending machine, it says a lot about me. No? It says a lot about us because it gives us some assurance no? that uh, if we do the right thing, if we behave properly, then God will grant us our prayer. No? But I don't know about you, as I said, no. but God doesn't seem to operate that way. No. Um, I prayed very hard for some certain people during this pandemic. I made many sacrifices. And I know many of you have bruised your knees and almost broken the decades of your rosary praying for a loved one. And the prayer was not answered. So it's not about our effort. It's not about how much we pay God. There's another, we don't know why God grants certain prayers and he doesn't grant others. So we should stop trying to buy God. In many ways, to have a vending machine as a metaphor for God, is like being superstitious. That's really what happens when you're superstitious, right? You do, you have a ritual so that nothing bad will happen to you. you know? I have a friend who plays mahjong every Sunday uh, and, and uh, every time he makes bunot or he, he's going for the, for the winning, uh, what do you call that, um, piece, no? he has a particular ritual. He knocks it several times. He he waves it around, no? and sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, but he does it all the time. So he feels that because of that behavior, he's going to get a particular outcome. So maybe it's good for us to examine no? our default image of God and to begin to think of God, to begin to re-image God as a gardener God. What would happen to you and to your faith if you began thinking of God as a gardener rather than a vending machine? Would your faith become stronger would your faith grow or would you lose your faith? Something to think about, okay? Okay, let's go to question number five. What do you mean when you, when you, that you can take your pain and transform it with love? I ended yesterday's talk with this, that Christ did this. No? Christ took his pain and transformed it with love and that's what we're supposed to do. No? And this is a very good question because maybe I didn't explain it well enough. So I'd like to spend some time explaining it. No? Um, okay, so this is really what redemptive suffering is all about. Uh, because of our Lord, pain and suffering are now a channel of grace. That's subversive. That's radical. It's unheard of. Because before Jesus, nobody thought much of pain and suffering. You know? it's, it's something to be avoided at all costs. No? But our Lord took the pain, and because he is the Son of God, every experience he went through, he has blessed. And because he has blessed pain and suffering, it became a very powerful source of redemption. The cross used to be such a terrible image. No? The early Christians did not even want to draw the cross or depict the crucifixion for over 100 years because it was too horrible. It was too tra traumatic no? because the crucifixion was a very painful thing to watch, a very painful execution to watch. No? They were reserved for the worst criminals of the Roman Empire. It was only after 100 years after people start, you know, stop remembering what it was like that they began to put the crucifix and the cross as a symbol of our faith. No? But the cross today is a very important symbol no? because it's a symbol of our redemption. 
but it's the it's also the symbol of pain and suffering but who changed that it's our lord who changed that because he embraces pain and suffering no? so remember our lord said no if you want to follow me carry your cross no and follow me but the cross does not refer to just any form of suffering it refers only to suffering that you have either freely taken up or you have freely accepted out of love so love is important no our lord freely took up his suffering out of love for us and he accepted the suffering all the way till his very last breath out of love for us no? as expressed in that song don't give up on me um so today when you think about it we we can we 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 have all sorts of suffering sometimes there are sufferings we don't ask for you know, like the pandemic you no know? some of us are on quarantine some of us are experiencing symptoms some of us are actually suffering you no know, because of our own condition or the condition of our loved ones you no know? some of us are stressed out panicking because a couple of members in the family have to be rushed to the hospital so it's 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 difficult No, nobody wants that and you shouldn't want that you shouldn't ask for that no i think it would be crazy to ask for that kind of suffering but if it happens you still have a choice whether to accept it with love or not i was just texting with a friend of mine who said he had to rush his uh, ninang to to the hospital and he's doing it he's doing it and he's trying to be strong about it um he can be bitter about it he can gripe about it He can even be mean to the person that he's taking to the hospital because he's so stressed out. But he's trying to best to do it loving, to doing it lovingly. That's what we mean by taking your pain, um, accepting the pain, and transforming it out of love. Some people have volunteered to take care of other people. They didn't have to do it, no? but they volunteered. No? Uh, they vo like, there, there were many volunteers uh, in New York no? who. retired medical workers who didn't have to but they volunteered no they risked their lives no they fr freely took up the pain and the stuff some of them got sick some of them died but they did out of love for people who needed their help so that's what we mean by the cross when the lord says take up your cross and follow me he does not just mean go out of your way and get hurt no he's saying take the pain that's going to make a difference that's going to help other people or sometimes you may find yourself already in a situation you're suffering you did not choose it but you can make a decision to accept it with love and offer it up and just like the cross of our lord it can be a powerful source of grace and and blessings because of christ this redemptive suffering is transformed from something evil because suffering is always evil to a powerful grace powerful source of grace for ourselves because we grow when we do that when we accept our suffering and offer it out of love but also for others it makes a difference so that's what we mean by taking up our pain and uh, transforming it with love i hope i clarify that because that's important okay okay i have uh, a few more a few more questions and this is very interesting and i get this every year believe it no i get get this every what do you mean betraying jesus could not have been god's mission for judas i love this question it's a favorite because i get it every year no Uh, it's always a question about Judas is always very interesting because a we don't really know the answer, but b we are forced to think critically given the non-negotiables of our faith. Our faith has certain non-negotiables, and we cannot give those up. So we always have to say, given these non-negotiables of the faith, these things, uh, these things, we must acknowledge and accept. What can we say about Judas and Jesus? that's the way to do critical thinking about our faith no so first non negotiable god's will or mission is not predestination predestination means the script is already written no matter what you want to do you can't fight it no? so in short it's not an open system it's a closed system the scientist god has full control no matter how you feel you have no choice So we can't say that God's mission for Judas is already predestined that he had no choice. Judas always was free to make a decision. That's why uh yesterday I was talking about our Lord washing the feet of Judas trying to appeal to his original goodness hoping Judas would change his mind. 
And some of you were reacting, what? If he changed his mind, what's going to happen to the crucifixion? Hindi matutuloy, as if we would be disappointed, right? If the crucifixion did not happen, no? Are you actually eager for the crucifixion to happen? It's something evil, right? But no, Judas, this is a non-negotiable. Human freedom is a non-negotiable. It's something we cannot violate in our faith. God, the church, the scripture has always been very clear about this, no? Um, now, the betrayal of Christ leading to his crucifixion, um, is that God's will and God's mission for Judas? In short, even if Judas had a choice, did God want Judas to betray Christ to lead to his crucifixion? Can you write down your answer in the chat box and in the comments on Facebook, whether it's yes or no? Of course, if you're thinking, if you can sense where I'm going with this, the answer should be no, right? The betrayal of Christ leading to the crucifixion of Christ cannot be God's will, even if Judas had a choice. Why? Because it's something evil, and God is all holy. And this is another fundamental non-negotiable in our faith. You cannot say that God wants something evil to happen because say that you're saying God is not all holy. Just as you cannot say God is not all powerful, you cannot say God is not all holy. So if God wants something evil to happen, betrayal of Jude, uh, Jesus, uh, the crucifixion of Jesus, then he is not all holy. So you cannot say that God's will is Judas betraying our Lord. Of course, this is related to the seventh and last question, which is more of an earth shaker. Father, what do you mean God did not send his son to the world to die on the cross? I got a lot of this in the comments and the messages I was getting. No, um, We've been memorizing this since we were in grade school, in Catholic school. no, And we say this, we almost say this, don't we say this in the profession of faith or something similar to it? How can you say that God did not send his son to the world to die on the cross? Okay, we're going to tread carefully here, lest I be misquoted. No? It's important to... To, uh, to, to be careful about this. No? But the important thing here is what we said about Judas. If God is all holy, he will not will something evil. Now, sending your son to the world to be killed, is that something good or bad? I think you will agree with me that it's something evil. No? It's not something that a father will want for his son. So the crucifixion and death of Christ is something evil, and using the reasoning and the critical thinking we're engaging in, if God is all holy, uh, how can he will the crucifixion and death of Christ? No? It's something evil. So some of you are probably thinking now, so what happens to our faith? No? Um, what, what's, what's going on? How do we make sense? No? And this is what uh, we, we mean when we say we have to think with our faith critically using the non-negotiables of our faith. No? It's non-negotiable that we are free to make a choice. It's non-negotiable that God is all-powerful. It's non-negotiable that God is all-holy. And yet, it's non-negotiable that Christ redeemed us. So how do we make sense of this? No? And um, so is God's will or God's mission for Jesus to die on the cross to save us? Uh, I think we have to say no. Because dying on the cross to save us is evil. To die on the cross is evil, no? even if the goal is to save us. No? It's more proper to say that God's will and God's mission for Jesus is to be God's presence among us by becoming one of us. That's the plan. Even before Adam and Eve committed a sin, many theologians are saying the incarnation was going to happen already. No? So unconditionally, whether the forbidden fruit was taken or not, was eaten or not, and whether there was original sin or not, whether we needed to be redeemed or not, Jesus was going to be human anyway because God loves us so much, he wants to be near us. He doesn't just want to create an open system, even if that open system com remains completely good because nobody sinned, no? but he wants to be part of the open system. When you love someone, you want to be one of them. You want to be very close to them. And that's what God is. No? And that's what the incarnation is all about. No? Um, but as we know, original sin happened. And there's human freedom. And there's moral evil. No? So God's will for Jesus, given the broken world that we have, is to remain committed to his mission despite the consequences. 
And the consequence was death on the cross. So death on the cross is the unintended consequence of the will of God, which is to save us and for Jesus to remain committed to his mission. In short, the incarnation would happen anyway, with or without sin. There's no plan A. and It's not as if you know God was saying, I'll create the world. Okay, oops, the serpent tempted Eve. Oops, Eve ate the fruit. And oops, again, she tempted Adam and Adam ate the fruit again. So now I have to come up with plan B. I'm classing God, right? What kind of a God is that? God knows everything. You know? God is all good, all powerful. His plan has always been to be present among us, to be near us. Okay, he gave us freedom and we screwed up, but he's still going to come and do whatever is right to help us. And that's what Jesus did. Okay? So that's that's basically how I'd like to... So those are the seven burning questions. No? Um and if, I, I don't know, because again, we don't have time to really uh, go through things, no? but uh, I hope somehow there'll be a recording in case it wasn't clear. Uh, please, please, you know, please uh, go back to the recordings or the slides, which I will post no? on, on the website. But here's something I want to leave you with. The questions are doors to a deeper faith. So if you don't have final answers now, and if you still have questions, those are open doors. Walk right through them so that you will have a deeper faith. As I said earlier, if one effect of this retreat is to get you to think more about your faith, to get more puzzled about your faith, and to talk to people more or read more about your faith, then I think this retreat has been very successful. Because the biggest enemy of our faith, the biggest peril to our faith is not lack of faith. All of us naman believe in God. That's why you're on a retreat. You wouldn't be here if you don't believe in God, right? All of us believe, right? The greatest peril to our faith is lack of time and lack of, lack of attention to our faith. So if you think more about our faith and talk more about our faith as a result of these talks, I think that's a great thing. Questions are doors to a deeper faith. Do not be afraid of your questions because God can handle the toughest questions. Okay, I'm going to stop here to give us a five-minute break because I need it. And uh, you may want to write down your comments, your thoughts in the chat box, even if we don't have time to think about it or to talk about it, the very act of writing it down is going to help you, okay? So I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to, um, I'm going to just give you a five, three to five minute break. Thank you.